Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Ahlan wa sahlan wa marhaban bikum. Welcome to the Suleiman Ravid Show. This Ramadan 1441, it is the uh, second of uh, Ramadan. The second fast has already commenced. We are coming to you live this um, Sunday morning, the first uh, Sunday in Ramadan. So yeah, Ramadan has started, uh, but under very, very different circumstances. Ramadan in lockdown, and we know that we're pretty much going to be in lockdown mode for the uh, rest of Ramadan, even though from the 1st of May we're dropping from level 5 to level, level 4, as the President had explained. Um, there's still going to be a curfew in the evenings. You are only going to be able to go out during the day for work, and then also special sectors under special circumstances with uh, certain restrictions. So, <clears throat> excuse me, it's, it's not going to be um, like the normal Ramadan where at night you can congregate in the masajid for Salatul Taraweeh, where you can do you know, iftars in, in the masjid, etc., where family members uh, can come for iftar and, uh, from, from different locations. We, we have those restrictions, but um, it is what it is. It's a test from Allah wa ta'ala, and Ramadan is the best time uh, to tap into the mercy of Allah, to tap into the blessings of Allah, to tap into the forgiveness of Allah, to ask Allah to forgive us, to ask Allah to uplift this test, to ask Allah to release us from the clutches of this um, virus. Right, so we have a live program. Towards the second half of the program, I will open the lines and allow you to talk a bit about your experience in terms of Ramadan uh, during lockdown. We'll also talk about um, the clip that went viral yesterday, um, the video showing uh, a number of Muslim men being arrested in what seemed to be uh, a sort of musalla. And, and there's been a lot of outrage that even though they were definitely breaking the law, and that is to be condemned and it was wrong, but uh, the manner in which police handled it and, and the, um, the very disrespectful words that they uttered towards Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, uh, that has come under, under scrutiny. So we'll talk about that also uh, a little later in the program. But our first guest for this morning, I just need to get used to saying morning and not evening, because normally outside of Ramadan, the show comes to you live on Friday evenings. Our first uh, guest is um, Imtiaz Kaji. Uh, he's an author, he's an activist, he's the nephew of the late Ahmed Timol. You would know he was in the forefront um, of, of, of the entire initiative and effort and process of, of getting some clarity on how the late Ahmed Dimol had actually passed away. And uh, that led to an inquest, and we know how the inquest concluded, and now there's a book in the pipeline. Hence, we are talking about uh, this to Imtiaz Kaji this morning. He joins us on the line via a Skype link. Imtiaz, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, Malana. Now, it's a pleasure to have you on the program. It's been a while since we last spoke. Can you just, in, 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 in uh, brief, bring our viewers into the picture. Your journey started, you, you had interest about your late uncle, you started reading, you started asking your grandparents, your grandmother in particular, and that led you up to a particular path that culminated with the inquest. Most certainly, Molana. I mean, look, I was only five years old when my uncle passed away, but I spent a lot of time with my maternal grandmother and grandparents, uh, probing them as to what happened to Uncle Ahmed. And obviously the turning point was, uh, you know, the um, sudden departure of my other uncle, uh, Mohammed Timol, who went into exile in 1978. So from the age of 12, I started probing my grandparents, reading lots of newspaper cuttings to try and ascertain what happened to Uncle Ahmed. Uh, why did Uncle Mohammed have to go into exile? Um, then obviously, fast forward the unbanning of the ANC. Um, Ma was very, very reluctant to testify at the TRC. I convinced her more now that it was important for her to relive her harrowing memory. Um, she then passed on in, 1990, in 1997. Um, we had the renaming of the school by former President Nelson Mandela, where the Azadbal Secondary School was called the Ahmed Timol Secondary School. And then uh, the publication of my first book in 2005, titled Timol Quest for Justice, which again was more written as an obedient nephew, uh, putting the biography of Uncle Ahmed in the public domain. And then I started this particular probe, Molana, to ascertain more details on what really happened to him. And with the assistance of uh, Yasmin Suka and the Foundation for Human Rights, uh, she had set up a team. And uh, with the grace of the Almighty, you know, we were successful in reopening the inquest in 2017. And uh, on the 12th of October 2017, Judge Bali Morte ruled that um, Uncle Ahmed did not commit suicide, um, as ruled by Magistrate De Villiers in the 72 inquest findings but that, in fact, he was murdered. But uh, from 
2008, 2009, I've been working on the second edition of the book, um, obviously focusing a bit more on the events leading to Uncle Ahmed's arrest, because the police had claimed one another that he was arrested purely by chance. And this was something that I had vigorously contested. So I've done extensive research around that, um, culminating with the assessment of the 72 inquest, the 2017 inquest, and then asking very, very pertinent and probing questions as to why has it taken so long. Um, and, and the reality is that, uh, you know, we're still waiting for Jao Rodriguez, who, according to his own version of events, was the last person in the room with Uncle Ahmed, and uh, we're waiting for his criminal case to commence. Yeah, that was going to be my, my next question, Imtiaz, that uh, the matter with Rodriguez, where does it stand? We know that his daughter came to the fore and said some interesting things. Well, that's correct, Monana. So, so his daughter has separately opened a case against her own father of molestation. And I think that that particular investigation is at a very advanced stage. But in the matter of Rodriguez, um, you know, since uh, his first arrest, um, after the inquest on, on the 30th of July 2017, there have been numerous court cases. Um, ultimately, his legal team, uh, you know, requested a permanent stay of prosecution, uh, which, was, which was overwhelmingly rejected by the full bench of the South Houting High Court in July 2018. And uh, they've now escalated the matter to the Supreme Court of Appeal in Bloemfontein, Molana. And the latest is that um, they, as the applicant, you know, they had, to, they had to file the respective papers by the 27th of April, which was this week. And then thereafter, the, the different respondents have got to submit their heads of arguments. And inshallah, thereafter, we will then hear from the Supreme Court of Appeal whether there will be oral arguments that will have to be heard or, or, the, or, or the Supreme Court of Appeal will make a ruling on his application. Now, all the while, I mean, this journey, the inquest, and now the case against Rodriguez, um, did you get any support from the ruling party, from the SACP, uh, the party to which uh, the late Ahmed Timol uh, belonged, from, from the, the, uh, the heroes of the struggle, those who were in the forefront of the quest for liberation? Look, the reality, Moana, is that uh, there was overwhelming support, you know, up till the uh, up till up till the period when the inquest was concluded, which was October 2017. But uh, since the time that Rodriguez has had his fourth his first court appearance, which was the 30th of July 2018, uh, support from the political political parties, political actors, political activists has diminished. And the unfortunate reality is that uh, you know they were left to account as to why they're not so comfortable with the fact that Rodriguez must face criminal charges. But the contrary is that, uh, you know, I've got overwhelming support from many, many other families. For example, you know, the, the Stephen Bant Bantu Stephen found, uh, uh, Bantu uh, uh, Stephen uh, Biko Foundation in King Williamstown, the Imam Harun Foundation in Cape Town, um, the wife of the late Suleiman Babla Saluji and Tirukeya, uh, the, the family of Mopetla Mohapi, um, uh, Solomon Monopani, Jacob Monohotla, Matthew Mabelani. Um, there's families in the Western Cape like Ashley Creel, Anton Franch, uh, Colleen Williams, Robbie Waterwich. So, yes, on the political front, uh, you know, the support publicly has diminished, but individually, families understand what uh, the process that I've embarked upon, totally supporting me. And in return, I'm actually assisting them to ensure that, uh, you know, that their cases also get open. How much of an impact did the, the Timon inquest have in terms of uh, leading to the Agate inquest? Look, the reality, Morana, is that, you know, that uh, the, the Timon and, and Agate matters were presented jointly to the National Prosecution Authority in January 2016. And I was privileged to be part of that presentation where our legal team, led by Howard Varney, uh, private investigator Frank Dutton, and, and also SC George Bezos were present. Uh, and we presented both these particular cases to uh, the former National Director of Public Prosecutions Advocate Sean Abrams at the time. So the Timor inquest only started on the 26th of June 2017. And the reality is that the Agate inquest only started so a month ago. So they were both presented simultaneously, both provided with overwhelming evidence that there was ev enough investigations conducted to show that both matters should pro proceed immediately. And the reality is that there was a four-year gap, a four-year difference, Monana, which has resulted in, in, in security branch officers like Stephen Whitehead, 
uh, actually passing on. Um, and he was critical, um, you know, in the interrogation of, 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 of uh, Dr. Neil Agat. I suppose you have the same fear with Rodriguez. He's of a very advanced age. No, most certainly. I mean, he's already 81. Um, you know, they depend on the Constitution. And again, you know, if you read his, uh, uh, his legal team's arguments, Morana, it's got absolutely nothing to do with the merits of the case against their client. But they talk of political interference. They talk of him being granted special amnesty, special pardon. And then they bring about the fact that uh, he was available in 1996 when the TRC uh, allowed uh, my grandmother to testify. Um, he was around in 2002 when I asked the NPA to investigate this particular matter. And why has it taken the state so many years for, you know, for them to approach him? And he's using this as a basis of his argument that he's been targeted uh, you know, because he's the only security branch officer living directly linked to uh, Uncle Ahmed's murder. And then we should not forget um, you know, that uh, the likes of Neville Els and Seth Sons who also testified at the 2017 inquest, and Judge Morley found that they must be investigated further for perjury. And more than two, two and a half years later, you know, the NPN and the Hawks have to date not even concluded the investigation on Neville Els and Seth Sons. Do, do you have any indication of why? I mean, is it, is it a case of the NPA perhaps feeling that these matters are now so well and truly in the past that uh, they've got more pressing matters to, to deal with and they want to allocate their resources uh, in, in that direction? What, 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 what kind of uh, indication do you get as to why they could possibly be moving so slowly on these matters? Look, look, Morana, my sense is that they are simply stalling. They're simply stalling and delaying, waiting for the fact that Sons and Els must pass on, and the same like Rodriguez, who are all in the 80s. But, uh, uh, you know, the full bench of the South Gauteng High Court made it very, very clear that the conduct and behavior of the National Prosecution Authority is unacceptable. They have to be taken to task. And, uh, and, and that is why we eagerly await, you know, for the SCA uh, hearing to take place. And in, addi in addition to that, you know, many of us have supported uh, the affidavit uh, submitted by Lucanio Calata, whose dad was part of the CADOC 4, where we're asking the Zondo Commission to investigate the NPA for not investigating TRC cases since 2002, as they are clearly mandated in terms of the Priority Crimes Litigation Unit to have done so. Has there been any pressure put by the families, the Timol family, the Agat family, and other families on the ruling party, asking them that why is the state uh, not doing more? Look, I mean, we consistently put this out in the public domain. And I think the sense one gets is that, you know, that there's, there's just, uh, it appears as if there's a strategy just to ignore us. And I can, uh, I can expand on this, Molina. I mean, we've had two correspondents sent to the president of this country. One from former TRC commissioners uh, requesting President Ramaphosa to apologize to apartheid era victims' families um, and, 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 and to institute an investigation to ascertain why the NPA has not reopened these TRC cases. And then we as a victims' family group have also put correspondence to the president saying that, you know, that this matter must be urgently attended to. And, and we've got absolutely no response from the president of this country. It's also very interesting you know, that we've just passed the elections that there's no political party in the election manifesto that talk about the TRC matters, including those on the so-called extreme left. So there's an absolute deafening silence on the part of political parties. Um, the NPA and the Hawks keep on stalling these particular matters, and we totally depend on media, on journalists like yourself, on ITV, and, and the judiciary, because the judiciary has totally supported our stance that it is highly, unex uh, highly unacceptable for the state to continue dragging and delaying these cases. And that is why we e eagerly await uh, the, uh, the SCA ruling on this matter. Now, coming to the aspect of, uh, of the TRC, are you also in support of, of another TRC? Many say, although it's, what, uh, almost 25 years later, uh, we, we should have another TRC because there were too many loose ends, too many unanswered questions um, from, the, from the first TRC, and then many things that were not followed up on. The principal matter, one and I said, the TRC was set up to allow victims and perpetrators to come together and to reconcile. But the principal basis was for, for apartheid era perpetrators to make full disclosures and full confessions. That was the principle of the TRC. And the unfortunate reality is that you find it till today, if you hear the likes of Joe Rodriguez, you hear the likes of Deertliffs in the Agate matter, they take absolutely no responsibility. 
You hear the likes of former police commissioner Johan van der Merwe, who will still justify that they were under attack from the ANC and liberation movements, and they were simply defending themselves, uh, supporting a racist apartheid regime. So the principle is that even now in the Rodriguez matter, if he is willing to make a full disclosure, explain in detail as to what really transpired, how he was part of the cover-up, who gave him the instructions, I don't think families have got a problem to accept their version. But the unfortunate reality, Molina, is that they take absolutely no responsibility. They uh, defend their actions and they operate it with impunity and they expect us as victims you know, to continue reaching out to them. And when we do so, we do so with a very soft heart, with kindness, with generosity. And I think many of us feel that this has simply been abused. So you've written one book. Now there's another book that's about to be released. Tell, tell us about the second book, or what's different about this book. Why did you decide to write another book? Look, as stated earlier, Molana, the first book was written as an obedient nephew. The biography of Uncle Ahmed was never put in a public domain. Um, and there were many, many issues that were unattended, and I would refer to them as there were many, many pebbles in my shoe that had to be dealt with. And in this particular book, obviously for the reader, there's some background information given about Uncle Ahmed's journey, his capture, and so forth. But then I, I, I directly confront the issue about his arrest. And there I have conducted my own investigation to dispel the police version of events that he was arrested purely by chance. I've demonstrated with empirical evidence that um, within the country, groupings, organizations were all penetrated, they were infiltrated. The ANC in London, Communist Party in London was definitely infiltrated and penetrated. And Uncle Ahmed's arrest was purely not by chance. And this is clearly demonstrated in the book. Then obviously an analysis is done of the 72 inquest compared with the 2017 inquest. And then very, very pertinent questions are asked. That why, why has there been a sudden turn in the tide after Judge Motley's ruling on the 12th of October, why are questions now being posed that why, why, are we, why am I pursuing Rodriguez? We must let things go. It is very painful uh, you know, to bring these matters uh, in the public domain. But we are very comfortable and convenient to selectively remember our past, selectively pay tribute to our heroes and heroines and our martyrs. But when issues of truth must be confronted, you know, we, we then retreat, we then look at alternative arguments, and the simple reality is that, you know, we have selective amnesia. And I think these are the issues that uh, are, are laying the basis and foundation, inshallah, with the grace of the Almighty for a third book, where the issue of transitional justice will be confronted and specifically dealt with the issue of Rodriguez as to why has it taken so long, you know, for this matter to, uh, uh, to unfold itself. And in that particular way, you know, I can officially close the chapter on the killing of my beloved uncle. What has all of this meant for you personally, this, this journey? Surely it's taken out uh, huge chunks of your own time, but it must have also come with a, with a deep sense of fulfillment as you see progress being made, albeit very slowly and, and fr uh, frustratingly. No, no, most certainly. You, you know, look, Bonana, with anything that we need to do in life, we need to put effort. There's effort, there's energy that needs to be put in. And I'm, I always remind myself that there are many others who've put in more effort than I have and have not seen any fruition of the work that has come out. So I thank the Almighty all the time that, yes, he's closed many doors for me, but in the contrary, he's opened many new doors for me. And, you know, I've got many, many other families out there that are totally depending on me for their guidance, as clearly outlined by Cosinati Pico, you know, who spelled this out in the forward of the book. Yes, it has taken a huge toll on me, but this is a price that one has got to pay, you know, when you confront the truth. Because those that are complicit, those that have been compromised, are not going to be sitting willingly. You know, they, they, they approach all sorts of different methods, you know, to make sure that they derail me. But again, fortunately, with the grace of the Almighty, they have been unsuccessful. And I'm totally committed to take Uncle, Uncle Ahmed's matter forward and in the same manner to do exactly the same for many, many other families. Finally, MTS, uh, just tell the viewers, when will the book be published? What's the, what's the title of the book and uh, where will it be available? Look, Molana, the book is titled uh, uh, The Murder of Ahmed Timor and My Search for the Truth. Uh, the unfortunate reality is with the pandemic and the lockdown, um, you know, Jakarta have only succeeded in publishing an e-book. And obviously, you know, many of us are still old school. We like to read a physical copy where we can turn pages and look at the pictures. So currently it's available on Amazon and Kindle. And, uh, you know, full data, details available on my website, www.ahmedtimor.co.za. 
But at the moment, there's no uncertainty as to when the actual printed copies will be made available to the public and uh, when, inshallah, we will be having public book launches. Anyway, all the best and shukran so much for your time this uh, Sunday morning during the month of Ramadan. No, as once again, Molana, to thank you, to thank ITV, because these are platforms that are very important that keep the legacies of Uncle Ahmed, Uncle Babla, Imam Harun in the public domain. And we can never forget, with all the challenges that we have in this country, there were brave men and women who sacrificed their lives in order for us to live in a democratic South Africa. Without a doubt. Mithyas Kaji, shukran so much for your time. Really appreciate it. Sorry, my pleasure. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. That was Imtiaz Kaji, the nephew of the late Ahmed Timur, talking to us about uh, the second book of his that's about to be published. And prior to that, he was talking to us about the entire journey, the entire process. One thing, you've got to admire the man's uh, determination. And um, he's being very, uh, you know, persevering in trying to get uh, to the truth. There's still some way to go, but he's made um, a lot of progress. Sometimes people may say, but, uh, you know, we know what happened in the past. Why do you have to go about proving it? But for the families, it's important. And I suppose uh, for history also, it's important. And, and for closure also, it's important. We are going to take a break, but I want to just uh, remind you, the lines are open, 011-086-0000. And uh, we're going to ask you to tell us what's, what's Ramadan been like. So there's the second fast. So far, how are you experiencing Ramadan during lockdown? And I also want to talk about that video that went viral yesterday. Uh, Muslims, unfortunately, uh, breaking the law and congregating for prayer somewhere in Pumalanga. Uh, but then police coming in and, and putting a cocked gun to the head uh, of someone who was obviously not posing any danger. And uh, also then uh, making statements uh, that were derogatory against uh, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We, we take those points and uh, we, we have a discussion around that. The lines are open. Uh, we talk to you after the break. Welcome back. So you are watching the Suleiman Ravid Show live this Sunday morning on ITV. We apologize for the prolonged break. It looks like uh, the fast caught our system. <laughs> um, the system fro froze, so it had to be rebooted. But we now are up and running. Uh, the lines are open, 11 The number will flash on your screen as well. I would like to hear from you, the, the viewers, uh, how are you finding Ramadan during lockdown? Of course, it's, it's different. It's, it's bound to be different, right? What are your thoughts on, on the video that went viral yesterday uh, of police storming a place? I, I don't know if it's a masjid or it's a, a musalla uh, or it's a room that's used for, for salam. And there were a group of men there performing salah in congregation. Um, to perform salah in congregation uh, in, in public uh, or in public places is prohibited, as we know, during the lockdown. If you're performing salah in congregation with your family in your own home, that's a different matter. So technically, it's not salah in congregation that's um, prohibited. It's salah in congregation in public places, like a masjid or a musalla, where various people are coming and, and congregating, uh, other than the place where, where you reside or where you work, uh, if you are working in essential services. Uh, so what they did was clearly wrong. They, they broke the law. Uh, they are at fault. Uh, but there were many who came out, including um, the DA Shadow Minister for Police, and said there was disproportionate force that was used. Uh, no need to put a gun to a person's head. And they were clearly unarmed. Uh, they may have been putting up uh, an argument, trying to explain them, themselves, but they, they were not resisting physically or in, in any way. I'll continue with my thoughts. Let's take the caller. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum as wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. You. How are you, bye? Alhamdulillah. Who am I speaking to? You're speaking to Mr. Mohammed, Mohammed Majoka, Mohammed Akbar Majoka. And where are you calling from, brother? I'm calling you from Pachepskin. Talk to in, me. In, uh, in South Coast of Kozulu mm -hmm. Nice to have you on the program. Go ahead. Yes, Alhamdulillah. But I, I, I saw the visuals of, that, uh, of the incident that took place in Pumalanga. It was shocking for me as a Muslim. Uh, when the police entered, uh, this, I think it's a musalla, and they uh, entered with their shoes without respecting the, the people that they, they were engaged in swala. And uh, to me, I think our Muslim community could have done more in the sense of uh, of uh, of getting the government to to recognize our issue during the month of Ramadan uh, for the. Uh, 
for the uh, for the Tarawi solar. For the moment, let me ask you a question, right? There were many people yesterday after that video went viral who said, look, uh, what these brothers, these Muslim brothers did was wrong because they were congregated in public against the regulations. But what the police did was also wrong and they need to be called out for it because they used disproportionate force. And people were particularly offended by, by the comment that they made about uh, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the prophet of Islam. Uh, however, the EFF have come out and said, no, there can't be special treatment for Muslims. You can't expect... Um, you know, uh, police to take off their boots when they're coming to arrest people. Uh, I saw a tweet of Nazir Paulson earlier this morning who said, all the blame is with these brothers who broke the law by congregating. Whatever happened after that, if it's wrong, it's, it's their fault. And, and that, that has been the sentiment of some Muslims as well who said, they put themselves in that predicament and because of them, uh, our, our, our Prophet Sallallahu was insulted. What's your thoughts on that? Um, Okay, on, on from my side uh, as a, as a Muslim brother, I also I do apologize uh, the, to to contravening the the situation of the safe the safeness of our, our health, and also another thing is that uh, we also the brothers that were performing there they also bro they definitely they broke the rules of uh, congregating there because there were uh, there was actually no space for them even to to move even one meter or two meters apart they were congested in, in mm. that in the small no social room. distancing yes no no social distancing on that that uh, that part yes i do but when it comes to even that's so, uh, I think it should have handled in, in a different manner in the sense of saying, yeah. okay, these guys are engaged in a prayer. In, in some cases, okay, they broke the rules, so let's go in uh, and uh, and do whatever we have to do, but respect the, the conditions. All right, Brother Mohammed, thank you so much for your call. Really appreciate it. Like, uh, also, uh, Brother, I just want to say that uh, uh, regarding the inter international, uh, international Muslim uh, party, I think uh, we should get our, some of our international brothers to get involved in, in, in a sense of uh, put more wood, put more pressure towards the government so we can at least have, even we have the social distance uh, thing, but we, uh, let our, our salah go on. All right. right. Jazakumullah for that call. That's Brother Muhammad out in Port Shepston. The lines are still open, 011-086-7777. One is the video that went viral yesterday. I see the Jamiat also took out a statement. The Sunni Ulama Council also took out a statement saying what the brothers did was wrong. They were not supposed to have been performing salah in congregation in public. But on the other hand, um, citizens, even when they do something wrong, you know, apart from lockdown, uh, if you break uh, the law by, by jumping a robot, uh, or by speeding on the highway, it doesn't mean that uh, you can be treated as, uh, as in any way that is deemed fit by the authorities. You still have rights. There's still a rule of law that needs to apply. So police need to be called out if, if they went beyond what they're supposed to do by, by using guns and putting it to people's heads under such circumstances, and especially that, that, that derogatory remark about uh, the Prophet of Islam, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Let's take the next caller. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Morning. You've got to turn down the volume on your TV because we're getting feedback, brother. Morning. How are you? I'm good. You're live on air. Talk to me. Okay. I'd like to put a complaint here regarding government, what it's doing. Hmm. I'm also a member of the Zion Church in Nagina, Maran Hill. Okay. You know, when we go to church and pray, when we're together, the God can hear us. When you're by yourself, sometimes the God can hear you as well. But it's, it's more strong when you're together with the people. He, he treated us like she beans. He's putting us with a she beans. And he accepted cigarettes because he's a part of that cigarette together with, the, with that man, the, uh, 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 Rupert. He's the owner of cigarettes because the, the president is getting the share from the cigarettes. That's why he's allowing the cigarettes in the church. I'm very, very angry with that. Are you praying at home at the moment, brother? Yeah, I pray at home. But I'm going to meet with a part of the, the member of the church now. But for five of us in Nagina, we're going to pray at 11 o'clock. But what is doing to us? Is, and what about those people, those army guys, they killing innocent people when they're sitting in their yard? What is, is not talking about that with normal, normal, this, uh, this minister of the uh, SA army. 
They're not talking about that. that they are, they're keeping that behind. All right, but those soldiers and police, they're killing people. All right. Thank you so much for your call, brother. Yeah. Thank you. Have a good day. That was a Christian brother watching the program saying he's not happy to sit at home and pray. He feels prayer has more effect in, in congregation. That, that there is that sentiment from the Muslim community as well. That's why you saw the case earlier this week um, that was broadcast live on ITV and other Muslim media platforms. But they, there's, a, there's, a, there's a sentiment coming from the majority of the leadership saying, listen, Islam is a religion of balance and moderation. Of course, our hearts would want us to congregate in the masajid, especially during Ramadan, but not at the risk of people's health and not at the risk of, of people's lives. So we, we sit at home with pain in our heart, making smaller congregations at home, but it's for the greater good, for preservation of life. Uh, you can all go to the masjid and mess, but then there would be many more people no longer alive thereafter to go to the masjid. That's something that you also need to keep in mind. Let's take to the next caller. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Okay, the call is gone. The lines are open, 011086777. We're talking about that clip that went viral yesterday. Some people are saying, and the EFF is included in this, some Muslims also are saying, it was the fault of those who congregated illegally, and therefore whatever happened thereafter is their fault. Full stop. Don't tell the police anything. There are others, like um, the theological formation that have come out and said, to congregate in public to perform salah was wrong. People have been told it was wrong, but what the police did was also wrong. And you cannot accept that police, in, in terms of arresting people for violating lockdown rules, start uh, uttering derogatory remarks about, against a prophet, any prophet. All right, let's take the next caller. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum salam, Maulana. I'm happy we brought this topic up. I saw the uh, video. And the thing is, we understand that uh, the people violated certain sections of COVID-19. That is fairly understood. Whatever the reasonable steps of, of, of the SAP and other officials that should be taken, it should be in its right perspective. However, we are very, very disappointed from a family point of view and from neighbors also coming out this morning and telling us that the way the, 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 the police and the law enforcement officers conducted this whole thing was in a very unseen manner, especially to the Muslim community of South Africa and the Muslims at large. However, I saw that they were going in with their boots, their shoes, they were trampling, the Qurans were also there, and then there was a gun situation and all the insults of, 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 uh, to the Muslims. And another thing is recently we were driving past the area in Crosby, and there were so many people that were walking with hampers, and we stopped them and asked them, what's going on here? They said, no, the Molanas by the mosque are so good people, they gave us all this hampers in it. Further, you take a country like United Arab Emirates, so many plane loads of, 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 of uh, medical supplies and other supplies are given to South Africa and neighboring countries, and then people should appreciate all those gestures, and so many private individuals and organizations Muslim organizations giving out hampers in it right. to the community at large. So people should understand and realize that they should have respect. That was a total different aspect of, of, of what they did, you know, their boots and all that. Fair enough, reprimand the people uh, in a way where you could have called them out individually without standing on the carpets, on the musallas, you know. They come in with their dirty, filthy shoes on there, and I think it was an insult to the Muslim community at large. Shukran for your call, brother. Much appreciated. The lines are open. Next caller, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Assalamu alaikum, boy. Where are you calling from? Very exactly. I'm calling from Chatsip. Speak to me. Uh, yeah. You see what I want to tell you about is the government said he, he took out liquor and cigarettes. Why do you only bring the cigarettes? Because uh, cigarettes is uh, not uh, in the health uh, thing. It causes uh, cause, uh, cause, uh, like asthmatic and all these things. And more people smoke cigarettes, the more sickness you get in the, in the environment. But I don't understand why you only have to bring the cigarettes because they're looking the shops and all these things. And, uh, you know, the people can't steal without uh, the cigarettes or liquor. And now they, you have to bring the cigarettes only first. Then you can bring the cigarettes. I mean, the liquor maybe is level two or level one. Mm -hmm. But I think the government is wrong. The, the elected organization, they should look up on all this before bringing right. the cigarettes. Thank you so much for the call. You raise a valid point. Many, many people, even in the media, has been critical about 
you know, allowing the sale of cigarettes. They say it's not a necessity. Uh, a counter argument has been that people who are addicted to the cigarettes are suffering from withdrawal symptoms, creating other complications, and that cigarettes is something that can be easily bought when you buy your bread and milk and essentials. Anyway, we go to the next caller. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Malana Rafa, how are you? Alhamdulillah, where are you calling from? Hey, I'm calling from Clarkstop. Yes, talk to me, Clarkstop. Yeah, I'm just saying uh, why the masjid can be closed for a long time like this, uh, as a, especially in the month of Ramadan. And then the, we believe, as, as a Muslim, we believe that khairi wa sharri min Allah ta'ala means this virus can come from Allah tabarak wa ta'ala and no one who gonna finish it will be said Allah tabarak wa ta'ala. So if you are not making namaz, you are not, re you are not taking salah and the Christian does not pray, so is it Allah Tabarak Ta'ala will help us if we don't play, we don't play. So what uh, my decision or my idea is to talk to the, uh, if the community can talk to the president uh, to release us to read Namaz, because now we are, we are in the month of Ramadan, to read uh, Taraway is a very problem, uh, to even many things, to do any, any, Bad is very problem. So please, if there is a committee, okay. community to do, uh, to which can talk with the president, All right. can talk J to him. Jazakumullah for the call, brother. There's many other calls, but uh, your, your point came across loud and clear. Obviously, there are those who say that you can still perform salah and you can still worship Allah at home. And because of the health risks here, the masjids are being closed, not because of any other reason. Uh, so, unlike where you have to go buy bread and milk at the shop, well, there is a risk there, but there's no other way to do it. Uh, there is another way when it comes to your salah. You can perform your salah at home. You can perform your taraweeh at home. It's not the ideal, but it's still doable. Let's take the next uh, two callers before we conclude. Uh, caller one, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum salam. Where are you calling from, brother? I call from Devon. Yes, Devon, talk to me. Yeah. You're live on air, go ahead. Yes, yes, I can hear you. Uh, I just say, uh, I just want to com contribute about this. What uh, what he, he was doing, the president is not right. For closing um, Marcy and, 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 and all the chiefs and allowed it, and other, uh, the others company like uh, taxi to every uh, 75%. Mm. I, I think the response that has been given to that is that they've made allowances for taxes because there are some people who are so poor that if they don't work for the day, they don't eat for the next day. And, and there's no alternative for them. Whereas when it comes to the masjid, there is an alternative. You can perform your salah at home. Uh, but yeah, that argument that you raise is an argument that, that is being raised constantly uh, by, the, by some in the Muslim community, in the Christian community, and other communities as well. Let's take the last caller. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum salam. How are you, Shah? Alhamdulillah. Where are you calling from? I'm calling from Peter Maritzburg. Peter Maritzburg. Talk to me. Y yes. What I, what I have my request is between Usala and. Uh, and the uh, police, who really try to break a regulation for the COVID-19. Hmm. Because, uh, because to me, it seems like the police, they went to break the COVID-19 regulation because they went in the mosque without, without uh, washing their feet, without to uh, wash their body, what, whatever the regulation that we're trying to follow. But as a Muslim, they went in the mosque, they keep their regulation, they, wa they wash their body according to, uh, according, to, uh, to, to, uh, according to our disease that we're trying to save. So right. to me, it seems like uh, police, they really they broke the uh, COVID-19 regulation. Okay, Jazakallah for the call, brother. Unfortunately, we're out of time, so I can't take any more calls, but really appreciate it. Yeah, it's, it's, it's an uh, issue that has uh, given rise to many opinions. Look, I'll be very honest with you. I feel Islam is a religion of balance and moderation. Of course, the masjid plays a very important role in a Muslim community and society in the life of every Muslim. Uh, but Islam has given us alternatives. Salah is permitted outside the masjid. Salah is valid outside the masjid. And these are very exceptional circumstances. Um, there are other diseases that are more deadly, but the infectious nature of this disease 
um, where, where within weeks an entire country can be crippled. In, in a situation like that, you'd rather be safe than sorry. You'd rather err on the side of caution. And I personally think the decision was right uh, to ask for the closure of not only the masajid but all the, the religious places as, as a safety measure because there is an alternative. You can perform salah at home. It's not ideal, but it's an alternative. Your salah is still valid. And uh, because of the circumstances, your reward will not be compromised. Yes, we don't feel nice to be reading Tarawih at home amongst a few of us when we're so used to reading it in the masjid, to be making iftar alone when we're so used to making it in the masjid. But this is about life. This is about people's health. This is about you know, stopping uh, South Africa becoming an Italy or a Spain or even a, a, a United States as we see. Now, if there are inconsistencies other places, we should not say, okay, because they're not doing it, we won't do it. We, we need, as Muslims, we need to show that we'll be more responsible. Um, that we, only, we won't do something only because government says now it's a lockdown. We'll do it because that's what's necessary to do under the circumstances to preserve our own health and to preserve the health of people. Um, there was a story this week about a masjid in, in the UK where only the masjid was closed to the public. Only five people were congregating daily, the two imams and three others, so that the salah could be performed. Both the imams got the virus, both the imams have passed away. And the other three have, have contracted the virus. So this virus is very infectious. It spreads very, very quickly. Uh, and, and look, did government uh, overdo it? Perhaps. It's uncharted territory. You'll never be able to say, and I don't think in the future also you'll be able to say whether it was exactly right or exactly wrong, whether it was too long, too short. The debates will continue. But let's remember that the attempt was to preserve life and to preserve people's health. As far as the video of, of yesterday is concerned, um, I have the view, similar to many of the ulama bodies who have released statements, that those people who went and performed salah and congregation in a public place were wrong. And we need to condemn that wrong and we need to remind people once again, as we've been reminding them all along, that uh, you know, perform, uh, perform your salah at home, stay within the regulations of the lockdown. However, that does not absolve the police. There are different levels of, 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 of wrongdoing. These were not rapists or murderers, right? Um, even rapists and murderers have rights. How you arrest them, how you treat them, the, this is all enshrined in the Constitution. So the manner in which they went there, they were, they were uh, they disproportionate in their reaction. These were not armed people. These were not people physically retaliating. They were verbally trying to explain themselves. There was no need to put guns to heads, and there was absolutely no need to make a derogatory statement against the Prophet Muhammad ﷺ because that offends all Muslims, including the majority of Muslims who are obeying the rules and, 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 and uh, staying at home because of, of lockdown. I see Becky Taylor has released a statement this morning uh, condemning the lawyer who offered his services free and told people go out and, and perform salah and congregation because the judge allowed people to congregate in the court. Um, the lawyer subsequently said his comments were misconstrued, although many are saying that they, they, they were so categoric, emph emphatic, and repeated in, in that video that has gone viral that how can it be misconstrued? But take that as a retraction if you like. But I'm just wondering, and I want to, I want to conclude on this, it's so sad for me. It looks like this COVID-19 has united many people around the world so that they focus their energies on combating the virus. But the Muslim community in South Africa has become so divided over this issue that every incident now, whether it's uh, a masjid where some people violate, or whether it is an informal settlement, or whether it, it just divides the community, that the, the, the discussion has become so charged, so toxic, so emotive, that um, you know, it's almost like people have settled into camps on the issue, and, and there can be no balanced, moderate, um, you know, uh, well thought out, structured discussion, and that's very sad. My heart and my, my heart really aches that this issue has split us in the way that it has. Uh, communities will never be homogenous. They'll never be one. They all, all, all have the same opinion, but difference of opinion should not lead to the, this kind of differences. The mud slinging, the derogatory comments, the fighting on all of the chat groups within families now, people having different views, some feeling, no, the masjid should be open because the taxi ranks are open and others feeling differently. The entire matter coming before court. All I can say is let's use this opportunity in Ramadan to ask Allah wa ta'ala to unite our hearts and to guide us through the situation. I mean, next week, uh, this time it will be level four. Let's continue to make dua that those levels come lower and uh, that we can reunite with the masjids sooner rather than later, but at a time when it is safe or relatively safe for us to do so. Until next week, same place, same time, inshallah, the Ramadan edition of the program. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.